this morning, I walked out onto my back deck barefooted. And the coldness told me something is coming. Can you guess what is coming? Here, I got a picture of it right here for you. What is coming? Snow. Snow. Are you looking forward to that? I heard a yes and I heard a no. Um, one day, it was really, really cold. Really, really cold at my house. Snow was everywhere and the dog had to go out. And if you look carefully, you can see that we even had to put boots on his feet because they were so, it was so cold. We made some boots. We came from Alaska at one point, so we know what, uh, what uh, dogs sometimes need. And here's what I had to do. I had to get on my tractor and I had to mow the little driveway and I was so upset of having to do that. All I could think of was dreaming about something nice and warm and a place to go. And I said, we have got to go on vacation when it was so cold. And so we began packing and everything was ready and I couldn't wait until we could get out of that cold and go on that trip. And we drove up to the Lansing airport and we were gonna fly out of Lansing and fly to Chicago and then fly to someplace really, really warm. And I was really, really anxious to do that. We went inside and you, how many of you have been to the Lansing airport? Okay, we went in the Lansing airport and we walked down the hallways till we came to the ticket counter. Now I want you to know my wife plans ahead and do you know she bought those tickets almost 11 months? How many? 11 months ahead of time. So we had those tickets. We got there early. We went inside. We went up to the ticket counter. And we had one problem. She was able to print her boarding pass at home. But they said we couldn't print mine. We had to see the counter. So when we got up to the counter and we showed them our stuff, and they said, you don't have a ticket. She does, but you don't. And I said, wait a minute, we bought it 11 months ago. And they said, no, you, you don't have a ticket. And I got almost irritated. I kind of lost my patience because I was going someplace, what? Warm, where I could go swimming and everybody else had to shovel snow. And they were telling me, no, you can't go. And I said, how come I don't have a ticket? And they said, you've already used your ticket. And I said, when did I use my ticket? And they said, on a Saturday morning, and they gave me the date, and you know what happened? The airplane flew away without us. Too late to go. And I says, but I didn't use that ticket on that Saturday morning. They said, yes, you did. And I said, wait a minute. On that Saturday morning, I was in the Grand Rapids Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I know because I was preaching that day. And they went, oh, if you were preaching there, you couldn't have used your ticket. And I said, no, I couldn't have used my ticket. And then they said, okay, we'll give you another ticket, and tomorrow morning you can go. So the next morning, I finally got to fly out, and we finally made it to where it was warm, and she will kill me when she sees this picture. <laughs> because we just were really, really tired when we got there, but we were very, very happy to be there. You know, God sometimes has to teach us patience, and I'm glad that God does. I just wish it wouldn't be so hard on us sometimes. But God wants us to be patient. God wants us to trust him. And I'm glad that God has patience with me. What do you think? Okay, go back to your seat.
Good morning, church family. Isn't it wonderful that we can trust Jesus at his word? That we can claim his promises and know that they're for us? It's so sweet to trust in Jesus. Is it on? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word and to just to rest upon his promise and to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, and in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing blood. I'm so glad I've learned to trust you, precious Jesus, Savior, my friend, and I know that you are with me, you'll be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, how I proved you are and are. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust you, oh, for grace to trust you. Oh, for grace to trust you camping spot on Sunday for some reason because of the holiday but they let us have one on Monday and Tuesday night so we went camping and on Wednesday morning Lynn and I celebrated our 53rd wedding anniversary by going out to eat breakfast and then she left with her sister Susie and flew to Florida away from me so I got to be with her on our anniversary for just a few hours. I think they left around 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, 
I think it was kind of appropriate, the title of the sermon. For me, it's very appropriate. Uh, I went to the doctor for a routine check of my blood work, and when I told him where Lynn was, he said, well, I would offer you congratulations and her condolences for having to be married to you for all those many years. Um, Marriage is a funny thing. Love is a funny thing sometimes. And I want to talk about that. And I want to begin by telling you the story of a young man and a young woman. It was 10 o'clock on a Saturday night when I got the telephone call from this young man. He was just like that when I was a kid um, going to academy and stuff. He was just a little bitty squirt of a guy. Now he was growing up. I was very early in my ministry. And uh, he called on that Saturday night at 10 o'clock at night, and he introduced himself, and I said, yeah, how you doing and everything? He said, do you know a young lady named Joyce, and that's not her real name? I don't think anybody that knows her will be watching on streaming, but just in case. And I said, sure, I know her. And he said, what do you think of her? And I said, she's a really sweet kid, comes from a big family, and she knows how to work. She's just a, a very special young lady. He said, well, I'm glad you feel that way. We're getting married. And I went, well, congratulations. I said, uh, when is the great day? He said, tonight. I said, what? He said, yeah, we're going to, um, we're going to drive to Tennessee, and we're going to go to a justice of the peace when we get down there, and uh, we're going to get married. And I went, how long have you known her? Three weeks. This was our second date. I took on the role of a father, rather because the father had died, I knew that. So I took on the role of a father, and I began to explain to him that this was not a wise idea. He was violating the laws of the state of Indiana. And he said, I hadn't thought of that. I said, you're supposed to wait three days in Indiana after you get a license. And I said, and you're going to drive through there? You're, you're not rendering to Caesar what Caesar's. And he had just gotten out of the military, so, you know, applying to that kind of helped a little bit. He finally put it off for a week. Went to Timber Ridge Camp and had the wedding. You know how long it lasted? You don't want to know. It was not based on anything except infatuation, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's take a look at our text. Our text uh, was from the King James Version, and the word charity comes from the the Greek word agape. It's not used very much in Greek literature. It's used mostly in the Bible. It's a higher grade of level than what uh, normally is accepted as the word love. And by the way, it's translated love in most translations. I chose um, what I'm choosing for a reason, and you'll see that later. But agape love was not a eros, it was not a sexual love, it was not phileo, a brother, a sister love. It was a higher level on a plane that God's on, that we need to be on. And the word suffereth comes from makrothe... Okay, I hope none of you know Greek. Pastor could probably do a better job pronouncing it than me. But that word comes from, that is translated in most places patience. And so you probably have memorized 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 as love is patient. Patient. What does that mean? Um, Able to accept or tolerate delays, problems, suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. Uh, Keith, why don't we change the resolution back so even though it'll be smaller, I'm I'm going off the screen with this. with, uh, to able to accept or tolerate delays, problems, or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. I didn't fit that when I was at the airport wanting to fly to a warm place when it was cold. Synonyms are forbearing, uncomplaining, tolerant, res- resigned, stoical, calm, composed, um, and so forth there. We could go on and on with that. Patient. Suffer long. Um, marriage and life is not always 
a bed of roses. Some of you aren't married, and you may think, hey, this doesn't have anything to do with me today. Yes, it does. Because love is patient, whether it's toward a wife, a spouse, a child, a dog, a cat. I had two cats come to my door. I almost put the picture in this morning. Two little cats that are kind of wild in the neighborhood. They came scratching on my door while I was trying to get ready to come and all of that. Lynn wasn't there. I had to feed both of them, and they wanted more than just one cup of food this time, not being very patient with me. Sometimes love is not always that patient. I'd like for you to go to Colossians, the first chapter, and verse 11 in your Bible if you want to follow along. I put it up here from the Living Bible, today's Living Bible. It says, this is Paul talking to Timothy, this young pastor, and he said to them, you know what I believe and the way I live and what I want. You know my faith in Christ and how I have suffered. And here we get it. You, ha you know my love for you and my patience. Catch that word? Here it is. He said, I have been patient. You know how many troubles I have had as a result of my preaching the good news. Paul is saying, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing it for the right motives. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and I have to have patience because of the way people have treated me. And then we, uh, we take a look at Ephesians, and it says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. If you're in love, you better be patient. And even, even so, we know that sometimes we don't have excuses. Let's take a look at another text here. I skipped one here. Let me see what I've got here. Yeah. Um, okay. Years ago, I uh, took a newspaper. How many of you take a newspaper today? Uh, that's what I thought. Most of us, there's a few here, most of us get our news off the Internet, right? It's a lot easier. When I had a newspaper, I, I really liked Dear Abby. That was one of the first places I went to because she gave some pretty good counsel. She had this one that came up. I went looking for it again today. I couldn't, or yet this week, I couldn't find it. But I remember clearly, she said, I want out of, this somebody wrote, said, I want out of this marriage, but the money is really rolling in right now, and I hate to walk away from it. Patience, being patient in, in uh, no, that's not the kind of patience we're talking about. This was a selfish patience. I'm going to be patient here because of what I can get. And that kind of creates some problems. Why do we go into a relationship? In this guy's case, or woman's case, it was financial reasons. Um, there was another reason somebody went into marriage that I thought was humorous if it wasn't so serious. His name was Socrates. How many of you have ever heard of Socrates? He lived about 400 years before Jesus. He, um, Plato tells the story, because Socrates didn't write that much. Plato wrote a whole bunch more about him. He was bald. He walked around in the wintertime and summertime barefoot. He never took any money for his when he gave speeches and all of that. He was a drinker. He drank a lot. Um, what was interesting was his marriage. Look it up on the Internet. You'll find some fascinating things about Socrates' marriage. Have any of you researched that, or seen that or anything? Um, one of the things he said, and we'll have to tell Lydia about this, he said an expert horseman that wants to really be top of his game will not go to the barn and get a stable horse he will go out and he will find a wild horse so that he can keep his skills up. Does that make sense? He said, that's why I married Zinthepi. Because she was cantankerous, she was angry, she would argue with me all the time, and I figured that would sharpen me up. And so I married her with that in purpose in mind so that I could, um, so that I could um, uh, be sharp in my relationships here, and it would just kind of keep me going. Um, he, um, 
wanted to avoid an argument. He was poor, by the way. And Zinthepi, there was some question about, did she, was she raised as aristocracy or was she of just common birth? Uh, I found both things in, in my research. Both people felt, you know, some felt one way, some felt the other. Anyway, she was loud and boisterous and ugly on top of being cantankerous. And they got into a fight and he wanted to avoid, um, avoid the fight and so he started walking out, and she grabbed what she could find, depending on which source understands Plato. She grabbed a pail of water and threw it on him. And he was heard to say, after Xanthepi thunders, rain must be expected. And then he said this, By all means, marry. If you get a good wife, you'll become happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. Even the best of marriages are going to have trouble. Even the best of personal relationships sometimes have trouble. And you have to work through them. I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you a text that may not sound like it ought to be in this kind of a talk. It's from Matthew 13, verses 27 through 30. I'm going to read what I've got up here on the, from the New International Version. Um, you know the story. A man went out and sowed seeds in his field, and then when he came back, uh, there was a bit of a problem, and the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seeds in your field? Where did the weeds come from? There was weeds coming up. They didn't have um, Roundup to put in the gardens back then. They didn't have those chemicals, and they probably didn't have diabetes and heart disease and cancer either. But these guys were, were talking to the master, and then uh, the reply was, an enemy did this, and he replied, the servants asked him, do, they want, do you want us to go out and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn." Why in the world would I insert this kind of a text when I'm talking about a love relationship? I tell you, it's because of what this text tells me about God. God is going to give you time. Now, obviously, the only way you're going to turn from a weed into a good kernel of wheat is going to take, what? A miracle. And God wants to give people time for a miracle to happen in their lives. God is patient with us. God is willing to wait for us to come along if that's what it takes, and that is patience. I talked about infatuation with that young man. What does that mean? What's the difference between love and infatuation? I'm not, this is not a sermon on that, but I have to throw this in here. Uh, you can throw this away if you want, uh, or you can go on the internet and find it yourself. But it says, love develops gradually over time. Infatuation in occurs almost instantaneously. Uh, there are some people who marry who were bitter enemies, but yet they grew to love each other. There are others who start their relationship with infatuation, but they let it grow. They don't let infatuation control them, and they let it grow. Um, love can last a long time. It becomes deeper and more powerful over time. Infatuation is powerful but short-lived. Um, love is, I'll go skip down, love is more than physical attraction. Infatuation focuses on the physical. And then we've got love is energizing. Infatuation is draining. If your relationship is a draining relationship, consider whether you're, what you're doing there. Love improves your overall disposition. Infatuations brings you into jealousy. And I have seen, I have seen people, well, you have to leave your husband away. Uh, this woman said, the husband says, you either be with me or you be with the church. You can't be with both. And she chose to be with her husband until after he died and then she came to me and said, I was wrong. I need to be rebaptized. And I had the privilege of doing that. But it, 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 he made her cut all relationships with her family. 
That's infatuation. That's where it starts. Love survives arguments. <laughs> infatuation glosses over them. Love considers the other person. Infatuation is selfish. And then this last one, love is being in love with a person. Infatuation is being in love with love. And I thought that was pretty good. Again, you can look it up there on the internet to find those. And friendships go that way as well. Love is sometimes painful. In the book of Genesis, when God had created Adam and Eve, they were perfect. And what did God say? It is good. It is good that these things have happened, that I have created these people. But then sin came in. And when sin came in, there was a separation. Immediately, there was a problem. Because the man said to God, the woman you gave me, it's her fault. You created her, and now look what she's done to me. And the woman said, uh, you created the serpent. Uh, look what that serpent did to me. Always throwing the blame. Sin breaks good relationships of love. And we have to recognize that. But we also have to recognize there's a cure for this. And it was not a painless cure. When you go to... Um, when you go up here to Mark 14, 34, you find Christ in the Garden of Eden praying, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus went to the cross because of the love he had for us and uh, patiently went to the cross. I want you to go to a little book called Hosea. If you know where Daniel is, Hosea is a little book. If you know where Daniel is, it's the very next book. And I think you'll want to go there. And it's, it's kind of a, a different, almost a sad book. And yet it's, it's an inspiring book. And we're going to spend a little bit of time with that. In Hosea, um, we find these, this verse on his second verse. It said, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go marry, and this is from the New International Version, go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her, for like an adulterous wife, the land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of whatever, and she conceived and bore him a son. If you've got a King James Version of the Bible and you're following it says, go marry a whore. Creates a little bit of an issue here. Why did God command that? Uh, did God command that? And why would God demand somebody love somebody? That's kind of like my mom would say, give your brother a hug and a kiss over that. And I was forced to give my younger brother a hug and him give me a hug. That ain't necessarily going to work with teenage, with little boys. And I just wonder how it worked with him. Give you an idea here. You can throw this out, okay? But in the book of Deuteronomy, well, in the book of Leviticus, it sounds like, um, it sounds like God told the people, the 12 people, to go and, and explore the land. You, you remember that story. They went out and they came back with a bad report and all of that. You would think that God had commanded that. However, when you go to the last sermon of Moses in Deuteronomy, he says, you wanted to spy the land out and God let you. In Deuteronomy, I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, but Deuteronomy 1 verse 22, if you want to look it up, it sounds like to me God permitted it. And in the Old Testament, it used to be if God permitted it, they considered God commanded it. And that's not always the case there. And in this case with this man, I think he loved her. And I think he already loved her, but didn't think he ought to marry her because she was maybe somebody who had worshipped some idols and was not necessarily from the best family. And he loved her. Have you ever seen a man love a wild woman? Have you ever seen a woman love wild men? In this case, that's what I think happened. Okay, end of what I think. Let's go to the scripture. It says that he married her. 
And I want you to know that after he married her, things went pretty good because the Bible said she, can, he, she bore him a son. If you're reading along there, it started out good. But it says she also had a daughter. Have you got it there in Hosea, first chapter? Does it say she bore him a daughter? No, it doesn't. It says she bore a daughter. Commentators suggest the daughter wasn't his. She bore a son. Commentators say he wasn't Hosea's either. Now, I don't buy it. I'm I'm not a, a deep theologian, but I like what Jesus said to him or the Holy Spirit said or God said, go marry this woman and have children by her. So I don't, I'm going to say they were his kids. You can take it any way you want to take it. But uh, it didn't start out and didn't stay real good. By retweet, reading between the mind, lines, we can see that pretty soon she became a member of the oldest profession. Do I have to go any more than that? Um, that's what she was doing. But I see in my mind's eye that Hosea did not give up on her. He still loved her. He suffereth long in his love. And then we go into the next verse, I mean chapter 3, when God said, uh, once again the Lord spoke to me, and this time he said, Hosea, fall in love with an unfaithful woman who has a lover. Do this to show that I love the people of Israel, even though they worship idols and enjoy the offering cakes made with fruit probably something like the hot cross buns and things of those days when they did they did them to worship. And, and that's where the hot cross buns of Easter come from, by the way, is worshiping an idol and, and those kinds of things. Um, almost no commentary or commentators suggest other than this was Gomer. Okay, so I'm not going out on a limb to say it wasn't another woman that it was, but... This was Gomer that he was to go and get back. And that's exactly what he did. Don't you love this picture? I I just, this is one of the highlights of this presentation. And that is exactly what he did. Hosea 3, 2. So I paid 15 pieces of silver and about 10 bushels of grain for such a woman. Then I said, now you are mine. You will have to remain faithful to me though it will be a long time before we sleep together. And that was from the contemporary English version. He went and got her back. That's love. And that's the kind of love God has. God is patient. Love is patient. God is long-suffering. Love is long-suffering. Why did God put that story in there? Obviously... It was to show, it was to show that God loved his people. And all through the rest of the book, it's an illustration of how Israel had prostrated themselves and had worshipped idols, and he was trying to buy them back. He did buy them back with Jesus Christ on the cross. But I want to deal with the human element here. And let's bring it down to how should you and I act. I want to tell you a modern a modern day Hosea story. She was 16 when they got married. He was a little older. She was a Catholic and he was a backslidden former Seventh-day Adventist young man. And they started talking about where are we going to get married at and uh, it's going to have to be a justice of the peace She said, the Catholic priest won't marry us unless you promise to raise the kids as Catholic. And he said, I'm not about to do that. As a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm not about to do that. And he said, an Adventist minister won't marry us because of our uh, don't be unequally yoked. And so that marriage was kind of doomed to start with. And they said, what are we going to do? And so she and he came to an agreement. When the time came, they would sit down with nothing but a Bible. And they would, from that Bible, decide where they were going to go with their relationship. No priest, no pastor. 
They both agreed to that. Kids started to be ready to come. How are we going to handle this? They'd been married a little while. And so the husband brought out the King James Version of the Bible. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, six days, seven days, look at the calendar. And she had no answer. She didn't know the Bible as well as he did. She was, you know, four or five years younger. What are we going to do here? And then all at once she got an idea. She said, you Protestants changed the Bible. We need a Catholic Bible because there it'll tell you the truth. He says, "Where? Well, give me one. She said, I don't have one. Well, where are we going to get one? We have to go to a priest. So off they went to the priest. Would you give us a Bible? And she said, would you show my husband where in the Bible that the Protestants changed it from Saturday to Sunday? And the Catholic priest looked at that and said, it's not in the Bible. It's not in our Douay version of the Bible either. And she said, what do you mean? He says, well, let me put it to you this way. If you're going to live by the traditions you have grown up with and the school you have been taught in, if you're going to follow those, you're going to stay a Catholic. If you're going to follow that book, you're going to have to be a Seventh-day Adventist. She walked out of the priest's home, a Seventh-day Adventist, and was baptized shortly thereafter. 35 years they were married. Kids have grown up. Kids have left home. Kids have, you know, moved away and not living real close. He began to show up late after work. He began to have funny things going on. He worked as a civil servant. You know what that means. You're a civilian, but you work for the government. And he came up with this, what's the name, Fleming, James Bond kind of things. And he said, they have recruited me to be a secret servant and I have to go underground over the weekends. Um, no, I don't think so. But he would be gone for a weekend. The telephone would ring and the telephone would ring. He started drinking. He was smoking. He probably never did quit smoking, even though he was baptized and all of that. He still was hanging on to it, and now it was beginning to come out. Uh, the smoking was more obvious. The drinking was more obvious. And the telephone would ring, and the wife would answer it, and there would be nobody there. She would hang up, and 15 minutes later it would ring, and the husband would be quick to pick it up. Oh, this is one of my buddies from work. But there was a lot of this quiet talking and this whispering and these kinds of things. And she knew something had to be going on. Something had to be going on. And then he wasn't there. She got a call. This person says, you don't know me, but your husband is having an affair and hung up. That was all it was said. Her fears were confirmed. What was she going to do? And then another call came. You don't know me, but your husband is having an affair with this lady. Gave her a name. And their rendezvous point is a mobile home out on this particular country road. She called her son who lived some distance away and said, son, you've got to come home. You've got to take me someplace. So he said, mom, what's this about? She said, I'll tell you when you get home. He got there and she explained to him what was going on and said, you're driving. I don't dare drive right now. They drove to the mobile home. There were no cars there, but there was the family lawnmower that the husband had said had been stolen. There were some other things laying around that it was obvious that he was moving in that direction. Son knocked on the door kind of timidly. Her, his mother shoved him aside, looked in, saw her husband's, some of her husband's clothes laying there. She drew back her fist and rammed it through the glass of that front door of that mobile home. 
reached in, unlocked it, blood dripping, walked into that home. There was a picture. There were his clothes. There were some other things from the family that were there. She picked up the photograph of the woman and slammed it on the floor, breaking it into a million pieces, blood dripping, and the son realized, we are, we've just broken an entry. I don't know if that's a felony. I think it is, especially if you're bleeding all over it. And he got her out of there as quick as he could, took 16 stitches to sew up her arm. He immediately called a friend of the family, a local sheriff that had known the family for years and years. He called the sheriff, and he met them there at the house, and there still wasn't anybody there. It was late in the afternoon by that time. He sealed up the house, you know, do not cross or whatever. This is a crime scene now. And he said, you guys go home. I'll call you. And if I have to arrest you, I'll come to the house. I know where you live. He sat there in the car as a friend of the family and waited for the husband to come home. And when the husband came home and realized everything that had happened, he grew pale. And the woman arrived, and they both said, we're not pressing any charges, just let this thing go. But the embarrassment of his legal friend finding out his history had its effect on him. A few weeks later, he had a heart attack. Taken to the hospital, they didn't know whether he's going to live or die. A girlfriend sent word back to his wife. He's all yours now. I'm not going to live with an invalid. Just like that, she was out of the picture. He had nobody. Picture her walking down that corridor alone in the hospital, going to see this husband who has been unfaithful to her, who has been telling her lies, who's been drinking and smoking and who knows what else he's been doing. And she's got to walk down that hallway by herself, praying, God, what do you want me to do? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love suffereth long. She went into the room with tears flowing. His tears were flowing because it wasn't the pain that was causing that. It was the sorrow. The philandering quit. The drinking quit. And you know what? Fifteen years later, I got to officiate at their 50th wedding anniversary celebration. There wasn't very many people there who knew what had happened. It was one of those secrets that really was kept pretty, pretty close down. And you know what? It took a miracle for him to turn from a weed to wheat. And you know what it was? He knew his Bible very well, but she knew Jesus. She knew Jesus. And knowing Jesus makes all the difference in the world on where we're going and what we're doing and how we're going to be free from the bondage of sin is knowing Jesus Christ. And she knew him. And she was able to forgive. I don't think it was ever forget, but she could forgive. And they could stay together. And she could love him. Hosea, kind of a rough story. The one I just told you, a pretty rough story. But what do they show? God is love, and God is patient. And he is instilled in some people, like that, mother, that woman told me, God can still love us no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter what, he'll buy us back. That's a wonderful miracle, don't you think? The wonder of it all. Just to think. That Jesus loves me. Let's pray.
Father, I thank you for the story of Hosea. I really love it. I'm anxious to see he and Gomer when we get to heaven to know that he loved her that much. I want to see that couple again in heaven. And Lord, I want to be there too. And I want to I want to be that kind of a person that can love and suffer if that's what it takes for people that I love to see them in your kingdom because that's what you want us to do to love people to show them Jesus and to show them that you love them enough to buy them back no matter what and may that day come soon I ask in Jesus name Amen